Okay, well, this is uh, final lecture for litigation discussion board number 15. I want to talk to you a little bit about post-trial procedure. There are a couple of aspects of that that I think are important for our consideration. First of all, we want you to uh, take a minute, you can Google on this, Indiana Trial Rules, and look at Rule 69, Rule 69, which is uh, rules for post-trial procedure. Uh, now this is uh, pursuit of what we call uh, execution or proceedings supplemental to execution. And then we often just shorten that to what we call pro-sup, okay? And let me say this to you, there are other post-trial procedures out there. For example, um, there can be reducitor where the judgment gets reduced by the judge. Uh, the judge can just take the case away from the jury and dismiss it. Uh, the parties can decide that they'll work the case out somehow and go back to the discussion we had about settlement. Uh, or um, someone's not happy with the outcome, they can file uh, an appeal and all the paperwork that goes along with the appeal. Now it's more rare probably for a person to file an appeal than the, if we get into the Rule 69 situation. So personally I'm going to spend the time on uh, pro-subs and execution and these type things because that is the more common thing and quite frankly this is a big area for uh, paralegal uh, participation and supervision of other staff so I think it's important for you to know about pro-subs especially so that's why I'm kind of focusing in on that now in a lot of common cases um, you know you're looking at uh, you get a judgment you think okay we got a judgment well the next question is okay so you got a judgment how do you get your money okay well, the early uh, laws were really all about execution, and involved in execution sounds kind of bad, kind of graphic, like, you know, we're going to execute the person, we're going to hang them or whatever. Well, that's not really what we mean at all. What we really mean is that uh, we're going to take their real estate away from them, we're going to take their car away from them, uh, something like that, sell it, apply the proceeds to the judgment amount. Now let us take the O.J. Simpson case for example. These people got a judgment against him for a million dollars. I forget the total number, but it was over a million I know. Well anyway, uh, they try to pursue him to, uh, you know, collect the money from whatever he has. Well in the interim, uh, he moved to Florida and they have really strong debtor protection laws in Florida, like for example, uh, you can keep your house free of uh, any kind of execution. So uh, the issue then becomes, well, um, how do we get this guy? Well, what you can do is you can follow with a series of what we call proceeding supplemental, order him into court <clears throat> and have him explain what he's been doing to live. And this is true on the most small, insignificant, you know, unpaid rent for $300 all the way up to multi-million dollar cases. No guarantee of payment. Now if they do have insurance, the odds are they are going to have to pay you at some point, but that again might be where they might want to take an appeal. So that's something to consider. Uh, another thing is that uh, you can file a judgment lien and you can execute by foreclosure sale. Uh, in other words, just like a bank can have a lien on a house, you can slap a lien on a house because you have a judgment lien. So if they own property like that or something like that, you can get your money. Well, uh, <clears throat> the big thing is for we want, want you to pay your attention to more than anything is Rule 69E, which is the pro-sup statute, okay? And remember when we say pro-sup, we mean proceeding supplemental to execution. So it's what it's saying is over and above execution. Uh, I've only ever been involved in one execution in my entire life as far as a civil execution, and that is uh, we try to get all this guy's furniture and stuff out of his house. Well, 
We took it to a used furniture store. It was a way more hassle than it's worth because these people have certain exemptions, just like in bankruptcy, if you're also in my bankruptcy class, those same exemptions apply to things like furniture. So it's gotta be worth more than say $9,000 or uh, there's no point in trying to sell it. And you know, when you sell used furniture, it's worth a lot less than new furniture. So uh, it's tough to come out ahead on that and make any money. And it takes months and months and months. There's all kind of record keeping. It's a big hassle. Well, for every hundred dollars that a person makes over a certain minimum, um, you can get like 25% of the money that they make. Uh, and so a perfect case was I had a guy one time that burned down my rental house because of a, uh, he caught his girlfriend who was renting this house for me. He caught her in bed with another man. So he sets the whole house on fire which is not even her house, it's my house. But anyway, the court ordered him to pay by garnishment in addition to sit in jail, but they allowed him to go to work every day, sleep at the jail, and then pay on the judgment every week. Uh, and so we got that paid off really fast because he didn't want to sleep at the jail. So he worked all this overtime, and ended up spending hours and hours, extra hours at the factory uh, anywhere he could uh, filling in just so he didn't have to go to jail. But anyway, using the jail kind of as a hammer, we got this guy to pay off this judgment right away through garnishment. So, um, you know, that can be done, believe me. I had another one where I had pros up to guy several times, try to file bankruptcy on a bad check. Well, you can't file bankruptcy on a bad check. So uh, we survived the bankruptcy, went after the guy in the litigation, got a lien against him, next thing I know, uh, you know, we've garnished him several times, he quits his job to avoid the garnishments, finally his father dies and he inherits $85,000. Well, our judgment was for $45,000. So basically we split his inheritance with him. So, you know, there's things like that that you can do uh, and uh, it does work out sometimes. Another time a guy owed, he was a construction contractor. These guys are almost important or impossible to collect from. So we got a actual, I just took a random, uh, basically all the banks in Delaware County, because I knew the guy worked out of Delaware County. I sent uh, ProSup uh, to every bank, uh, credit union, everybody like that in uh, Delaware County, and bingo, we got him. and. Uh, we actually got uh, the full bill paid, $5,000. So it was amazing, plus attorney fees and so forth. So, uh, and then of course he's crying and calling me, hey, I need that money. I'm like, well, you should have thought of that, you know, before you stiffed uh, this company. But a lot of people don't pursue these things like they really should. Uh, and so uh, when you have a judgment pending, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing uh, that you'll, you'll get dozens of these if you're working in a law firm that does collection work, especially I did a lot of landlord tenant work, uh, credit card work, you know, where you're representing maybe a gasoline company or uh, another kind of credit card company, department store or whatever. Uh, you know, you can get a lot of work collecting these judgments, but the thing what you get into is uh, once you get the judgment, you have to pros up like every month uh, and it can be difficult. And the problem you get into is uh, it's hard to justify doing all this work if you're not going to collect any money, but you have to do the work in order to collect the money. So it's kind of a catch-22 type situation, uh, but I can see many of you uh, being involved in doing these pro subs basically for a living. It can be a good paying job for an independent contractor where you could go in somewhere where someone else has worked on getting the judgment with an attorney, then they turn around and send them over to you uh, and then you prepare uh, all the paperwork for these pro subs month after month. You can do that on your kitchen table. You know, you don't have to be in some fancy office in order to do pro subs. This way you can cut out the overhead. Uh, if you're like married and you just want a, something to do or you, there's no benefits and you just go into several attorneys and do all their uh, pro sub work, um, you can probably uh, find work to do. Uh, especially in a small town. Uh, and you can do this for multiple firms because usually there is no 
conflicts like we've talked about in this independent contractor situation. So I uh, highly recommend that you look at this ProSup business uh, or collection work, work for a collection firm. You can find them in the yellow pages uh, and go talk to them about, hey, could I do some outside contracting and just do your ProSups for you. And if you go in there and you know what a ProSup is, that right there is going to probably help you a lot to get a job. Uh, most people don't know what ProSups are. So very important, keep that in mind. Uh, thanks for all your help and hard work this uh, summer session. Appreciate every one of you. Uh, and so good luck in finishing up. And like I always like to say, finish strong. And then uh, we'll come out on top and it'll be really good for you. Uh, hope to see you if you haven't had a bankruptcy court yet. Uh, I'm going to be teaching that again in the fall, para 212-00F and para 212-01F. And then also I'm teaching business associations, which is para 205-00F. And uh, so those are three options for you. Uh, I would keep uh, those in mind if you need a course. So uh, stay in touch. Uh, we'll uh, be giving you new information uh, as we go along. Uh, glad to see you, see your name on my student list in the fall. So thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you all later.